here on this earth. We know that photosynthesis is the primary source of energy of most living beings. So for that, we need sunlight. Another major requirement is the presence of Earth's atmosphere that can sustain life on Earth. How do we know that Earth has an atmosphere? To answer this question, let me take you back to school. You might have learned about, or you may even have done the experiment where you take a glass of water, place a piece of cardboard over it, hold it in your hand, turn the glass over, take your hand away, and the cardboard doesn't fall. From this, scientists deduced that there is something that exerts an upward pressure. And they reasoned that this must be because of the air around us, that's the atmosphere, and soon we came to know that this atmosphere or the air around us is made up of molecules of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, etc., and eventually made up of atoms. Now let me digress a little. What happens if there was a small hole in that cardboard? Or maybe even two holes? Let's be bold. Here's a handkerchief woven with hundreds of holes. What happens if I use this instead of my cardboard piece and then find out whether the water spills through or not? Some of you may think that the water will spill through. Some may think not. And many of you may be fence sitters. So let's try and find out. So you can see that the water is not spilling through. Completely amazing, right? And the only reason I wanted to show you this is because this is due to a property of water called surface tension. And once this property was discovered, people spent a lot of time trying to make some object or property or material that can reduce surface tension. And this is called soap. Yes, soap reduces surface tension. It allows your clothes to be wetted and therefore well cleaned. And I wanted to point this out as an example of how a discovery actually leads to an invention or an application in technology. Now let's get back to atoms. So we know that in an atom, there's a central nucleus with electrons going around it. And these electrons were discovered about 120 years ago. The nucleus itself was discovered about just about 100 years ago. In 50 years from that time, just in a half a century, the transistor was discovered. And we went from a discovery of a fundamental particle, that is the electron, to an application, that is electronic goods. Again, we see that fundamental discoveries in science lead to applications in technology. It's what I like to call the triangle of science, engineering, and technology. Now, what other fundamental particles do we know about? The nucleus has protons and neutrons, but these are not fundamental particles because you can break them down further, as you can see in the cartoon. But scientists discovered that while all matter around us, this room, you, myself, everything in fact that we know about is made up of ordinary matter which contains atoms like these, there are so many other fundamental or elementary particles which are not part of ordinary matter. In fact, scientists discovered so many of these elementary particles that we practically had a periodic table of particles. One of the most important and exotic of all these particles are the neutrinos. And why do I call them important and exotic? Short answer. Without neutrinos, the universe and we would not exist. That makes them important, right? What about the exotic part? For that, you need to hear another story, this time the story of our sun and how it shines. So, this is a story that was of interest to not just physicists, but also to biologists, because as I already told you, life on Earth is possible because of sunlight. And now we know that the sun shines because of processes of nuclear fusion that take place in its core, releasing large numbers of neutrinos. How many neutrinos? 
if I hold out my thumb in the direction of the sun, then about 40 billion neutrinos pass through my thumbnail every second. That's really large. And what happens at night? The sun is still shining, neutrinos are still being emitted, and the earth is transparent to these neutrinos. So the neutrinos simply pass through the earth and reach us on the other side. The reason we don't see them or feel them is because among the trillions and trillions of neutrinos that pass through us during our lifetimes, hardly one of them will interact with us. They are so elusive. Many experiments around the world have established these solar neutrinos really exist. That is, the sun actually shines in neutrinos. If we were special mutant people who didn't have ordinary vision, we were blind to ordinary light, but we had special neutrino vision, just like X-ray vision, then this is how the sun would look like to us. Pretty much like the normal sun, right? Except much, much larger. But in the process of discovering these solar neutrinos and establishing that this is how the sun shines, scientists discovered that neutrinos have very strange properties. Neutrinos come in three different types, and they like to mix or oscillate between each other. Let me explain this through an example. Let's suppose I have three mischievous friends, nearly identical triplets. Let's call them Shazia, Sophia, and Sunita. So one day I'm walking along the street, and I meet the three of them going out together, I call out to the one in the middle, Hey, Sophia, how are you? And she says, I'm not Sophia, I'm Sunita. So I say, sorry, Sunita, I thought you were Sophia. And she smiles, waves away, keeps walking, turns around, gives me a cheeky grin and says, you know, actually, I'm Shazia. Neutrinos are just like this. They like to change their minds and their nature. And you never know which type of neutrinos are actually going along unless you actually catch one and find out. That makes them pretty exotic, right? And of course, once this was discovered, there was a rush to study neutrinos from all kinds of sources, and there are many of them. How were all these discoveries made? First of all, all neutrino detectors are underground. That's because the Earth is bombarded by large numbers of cosmic rays from outer space. The Earth acts as a shield. So when you build the neutrino detector underground, these cosmic rays are absorbed and you get a cleaner neutrino signal underground. Second, you must have large detectors because the neutrinos interact so weakly. And finally, you need patience, a lot of it, because neutrino interaction rates are so small. Once you have all these, you're good to go. And there are so many weird things happening with neutrinos that neutrino detectors have been built in so many places across the world, including under Earth, under water, and even under ice at the South Pole. In the last nearly two decades, there has been an effort, a pan-Indian effort, to locate a neutrino lab in India, the India-based Neutrino Observatory, or the INO. More than 20 research institutions, including universities, IITs, have come together to form a collaboration to build a 50,000-ton detector to study atmospheric neutrinos. Yes, the same atmosphere which held up the water in our glass and didn't allow the water to leak through the handkerchief. Just like other neutrino detectors, INO will be placed underground and will be accessed by a long road or rail-like tunnel, hundreds of kilometers of which have been built across India, and so this construction is routine. One of the main goals of INO will be to study some strange properties related to the masses of these neutrinos. We know that, for example, if you look around the universe, there are hundreds of galaxies. All these galaxies have planets and stars. So far, nobody has found a galaxy made up of antimatter. But if the universe began in a Big Bang, then we know that we must have got equal amounts of matter and antimatter. So where has all the antimatter gone? This is one of the most important questions that's puzzling scientists today. We believe that neutrinos hold the key to answering this question. The detector that will be located in INO is a magnetized one. When built, it will be the most massive magnet in the world. 50,000 tons of magnetized iron, 30,000 active detector elements, 
more than 4 million channels of electronics built with precision technology. The whole detector, the size of a five-story building, you can see a small human at the bottom of this schematic. And we believe that this detector will completely indigenous, every part of it, uh, R&D and design and development done in some lab across India. Dozens of students have got their PhDs over the last 10 years working on various components of this detector and many private industries have also been collaborating with us from manufacturing the special iron required for the high magnetization as well as various detector components, electronics, etc. So in its physics goals, INO will be complementary to other neutrino detectors around the world. Therefore, I believe that INO is not just another experiment. It is a rare collaboration of science and industry holding the potential for numerous technological spin-offs while hopefully advancing our knowledge in science. I would like to highlight for you a mini ICAL detector, a baby prototype of 85 tons that has been up and running in Madurai for more than an, about a year and a half now. Students from Madurai, Tamil Nadu, across India in fact, have been enthusiastically coming to work on this detector at the cutting edge of technology. I believe that INO will galvanize science research across the country and give researchers and especially students a very rare opportunity to design, develop and maintain such a complex detector at the cutting edge of technology with so many potential technological spin-offs. I would also like to remind you that every medical imaging instrument was at one time a particle detector. Think X-rays, PET scans, MRIs, etc. It's possible that the detector technology of INO may in the future be adapted for medical imaging. There are so many possibilities. But I would like to reiterate that at the heart of it, INO is just a basic science research experiment. A search to understand or to better understand one of the most ubiquitous particles in our universe. And I find it fascinating because it's the story of the only universe that we have ever known. From soap to surface tension to neutrinos to life and hence our ability to think about all of it. Thank you.